Continuing on with particle in a ring, we showed last time how the specific restrictions of our wave function to a region with zero potential energy inside this ring here at r equals r and theta equals pi over 2, we could simplify our Hamiltonian from a three-dimensional Hamiltonian to one which depends only on the azimuthal angle phi inside this ring. And we have a Hamiltonian which is minus h bar squared over 2m r squared, our distance from the origin times second derivative with respect to that angle. And we have no potential energy inside this ring, so our potential term is zero. And our wave function is just a function of phi as well, so we're seeking to solve this Schrodinger equation here with this Hamiltonian. So the next thing we can do is take this Schrodinger equation here and then try to simplify it for isolating just the, wave, the second derivative of the wave function by itself on one side here. So if I take d squared d phi squared of psi of phi, as I would have here, then I can multiply by 2mr squared over minus h bar squared, and I get 2mr squared, the e is over here, over minus h bar squared times psi of phi. Okay, so what we can do now is we can define a constant called k, and we can say that k equals, we're going to have it be r over h bar times the square root of 2 mass of particle times its energy. And when we do it like this, what this reduces to is we have the second derivative of our wave function, d phi squared, is going to be equal to, this part over here is minus k squared times phi, times psi of phi. So when we have a wave function where our second derivative equals a minus constant squared times the original wave function itself, there's a few guesses we could guess for this based off of differential equations, but I'm going to make a particularly uh, informed guess. And we're going to guess that our wave function takes the form of a complex exponential e to the i k phi. Because we'll notice here that the second derivative with respect to phi of e to the i k phi is i squared k squared, and i squared is minus 1. So we get minus k squared times e to the i k phi. So in, it indeed does fit this functional form here. So this is a reasonable guess for what our wave function is going to look like. Now let's see if we can find anything else out about the value of what k needs to be. Well, we know that our, ring, our particle here is constrained to be on this ring. This ring is a one-dimensional periodic system. And that means that it has some periodic boundary condition. And that periodic boundary condition is that if you go once all the way around the ring, you have to be back at the position you started at, and your wave function has to have the same value, otherwise it would have more than one value at the same point, and that doesn't make sense. So when we go all the way around the ring, or if we go two pi radians around, we reach the same spot again, and our wave function has to have the same value that it originally had. Okay, so we know that psi of phi has to equal psi of phi plus 2 pi. Okay, so what does this imply for our wave function down here? Well, we can substitute in phi plus 2 pi for in our wave function and set it equal to psi of phi there. So we have e to the i k phi equals e to the i k parentheses phi plus 2 pi. And now I can say that e to the i k phi plus 2 pi is e to the i k phi plus i k 2 pi. Okay, and that's all, that's all good and well. And then we can also factor that to say e to the i k phi times e to the i k 2 pi. All right, and then we have Again, on this side, we still have e to the i k phi. So we have e to the i k phi on both sides, so we can divide by e to the i k phi, cancel those out. Then what we end up with is 1 
equals e to the i k 2 pi. And if we remind ourselves of Euler's theorem, we know that a complex exponential like this, e to the i k 2 pi, has to be equal to cosine 2 pi k plus i sine 2 pi k. Okay, and this has to be equal to 1 over here. All right, so we've got a part here which is real, and we've got a part here with i which is imaginary. So 1 doesn't have any imaginary part to it, so our imaginary part has to be equal to 0. And thus, the only thing we have left is our cosine part, so this has to be equal to 1. So let's evaluate each of these conditions here. We've got that sine of 2 pi k has to equal 0. Okay, well, when is, when is sine equal to 0? Sine is equal to 0 if we graph here from 0 to 2 pi. Sine is 0 at 0, 0 again at pi, and at 0 again at 2 pi. So it's 0 at every integer value of pi. So that means that this 2 pi k is equal to n pi, where n is some integer. So dividing out the pi's and the 2 here, we have based off of this restriction that k equals an integer over 2. OK, that's all fine. Now let's look at the restriction for the cosine term. So we have cosine of 2 pi k equals 1. So when does cosine equal 1? Well, cosine equals 1 at 0. Then it equals 0 at pi over 2 minus 1 at pi, 0 at 3 pi over 2. And then at 2 pi, it equals 1 again. So it equals 1 at 2 pi at integers of 2 pi. So we know from this that 2 pi k is equal to 2 pi times some integer n, again, where n belonging to integers. So dividing out here, what we have is that k is equal to n. So does this satisfy the above equation? Well, if k is equal to n, then k can be equal to another integer, which is n over 2 because we can just have, because if we take any integer and then we divide it by 2, it's that, that's still true, so that works. We could, for example, pick, we could pick 2 for this integer up here and 1 for this integer down here. That would, that would work for both. Okay, so basically we have this restriction that k has to be some integer. So we substitute that back into the value we have up there where we have, so we'll substitute for k, n equals r over h bar times the square root of 2 times me. So if I rearrange this and solve for e, you should be able to convince yourself that the equation you arrive on is that e for a given value of the integer n is going to be equal to h bar squared n squared over 2m r squared. So that's our final value there. And this n is constrained to be an integer. Does, it can be either positive or negative. So it can be 0, plus or minus 1, plus or minus 2, etc., all the way up to plus or minus infinity. So let's look at the differences that this has between the particle and a box. It's quite similar to the particle in a box. Particle in a box energies are h squared n squared over 2 ml squared. And here we've got h bar squared n squared over 2 m r squared. So it looks like our effective L here is actually um, 2 pi times the radius, 2 pi r. And there's a factor of 2 pi in each of these h bars. So h, h bar is h over 2 pi. So this could also be written as h squared n squared over 2m times 2 pi r quantity squared. So the 2 pi r being squared there. So this is effectively you have a particle in a box 
and it gets the same type of quantization, the same type of integers, the same types of energies, but the only difference you end up getting is the fact that now these ends can be positive or negative. So for each energy level that we get for the particle in a ring above the ground state, we're going to have two possible energy levels that we can fill. Whereas for the particle in a box, at every energy level, there was only one that we could fill. So we get a result which is very similar to the particle in a box, but our periodic boundary condition, instead of having two boundary conditions, has given us these extra degenerate states up above the ground state.